Another Way by Ambrose Bierce. Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. I lay in silence, dead. A woman came and laid a rose upon my breast and said, May God be merciful. She spoke my name and added, It is strange to think him dead. He loved me well enough, but twas his way to speak it lightly. Then beneath her breath, Besides, I knew what further she would say, but then a footfall broke my dream of death. Today the words are mine. I lay the rose upon her breast, and speak her name, and deem it strange indeed that she is dead. God knows I had more pleasure in the other dream. And a poem. This recording is in the public domain. Any Wife to Any Husband by Robert Browning. Read for LibriVox.org by Capricia Page. My love, this is the bitterest that thou who art all truth, and who dost love me now as thine eyes say as thy voice breaks to say, shouldst love so truly, and couldst love me still a whole life through, had but love its will, would death that leads me from thee brook delay. I had but to be by thee, and thy hand would never let mine go, thy heart would stand the beating of my heart to reach its place. When should I look for thee and feel thee gone, when cry for the old comfort and find none? Never, I know, thy soul is in thy face. Oh, I should fade, tis willed so, might I save gladly I would, whatever beauty gave joy to thy sense, for that was precious too. It is not to be granted, but the soul whence the love comes, all ravage leaves that whole. Vainly the flesh fades. Soul makes all things new. And twould not be because my eye grew dim, thou couldst not find the love there, thanks to him who never is dishonoured in the spark he gave us from his fire of fires, and bade remember whence it sprang, nor be afraid while that burns on, though all the rest grow dark. So. How thou wouldst be perfect, white and clean, outside and inside, soul and soul's demean alike, this body given to show it by, O oh, three parts through the worst of life's abyss, what plaudits from the next world after this, couldst thou repeat a stroke and gain the sky? And is it not the bitterer to think that, disengage our hands and thou wilt sink although the world was love and very deed i know that nature pass a festive day thou dost not throw its relic flower away nor bid its music loitering echo speed thou lets the stranger's glove lie where it fell if old things remain old things all is well for thou art grateful as becomes man best and hadst thou only heard me play one tune, or viewed me from a window, not so soon with thee would such things fade as with the rest. I seem to see, we meet and part, tis brief. The book I open keeps a folded leaf, the very chair I sat on breaks the rank. That is a portrait of me on the wall. Three lines. My face comes at so slight a call. And for all this, one little hour's to thank. But now, because the hour through the years was fixed, because our inmost beings met and mixed, because thou once hast loved me, wilt thou dare say to thy soul, and who may list beside, therefore she is immortally my bride, 
chance cannot change that love nor time impair so what if in the dusk of life that's left i a tired traveller of my sun bereft look from my path when mimicking the same the firefly glimpses past me come and gone where was it till the sunset where anon it will be at the sunrise what's to blame is it so helpful to thee canst thou take the mimic up nor for the true thing's sake put gently by such efforts at a beam is the remainder of the way so long thou need'st the little solace thou the strong watch out thy watch let weak ones doze and dream ah but the fresher face it is true thou'lt ask some eyes are beautiful and new some hair how could one choose but grasp such wealth and if a man would press his lips to lips fresh as the wilding hedgerow's cups there slips the dew-drop out of must it be by stealth it cannot change the love kept still for her much more than such a picture to prefer passing a day with to a room's bare side the painted form takes nothing she possessed yet while the titian's venus lies at rest a man looks once more what is there to chide so must i see from where i sit and watch my own self sell myself my hand attach its warrant to the very thefts of me thy singleness of soul that made me proud thy purity of heart i loved aloud thy man's truth i was bold to bid god see love so then if thou wilt give all thou canst away to the new faces disentranced say it and think it abjure it no more reissue looks and words from the old mint pass them afresh no matter whose the print image and superscription once they bore recoin thyself and give it them to spend it all comes to the same thing at the end since mine thou wast mine art and mine shalt be faithful or faithless sealing up the sum or lavish of my treasure thou must come back to the heart's place here i keep for thee only why should it be with the stain at all why must i twixt the leaves of a coronal put any kiss of pardon on thy brow why need the other women know so much and talk together such the look and such the smile he used to love with then as now might i die last and show thee should i find such hardship in the few years left behind if free to take and light my lamp and go into thy tomb and shut the door and sit seeing thy face on those four sides of it the better that they are so blank i know why time was what i wanted to turn o'er within my mind each look get more and more by heart each word too much to learn at first and join thee all the fitter for the pause neath the low doorway's lentil that were cause for lingering though thou callest if i durst and yet thou art the nobler of us two what dare i dream of that thou canst not do outstripping my ten small steps with one stride i'll say then here's a trial and a task is it to bear if easy i'll not ask though love fail i can trust on in thy pride pride when those eyes forestall the life behind the death i have to go through when i find now that i want thy help most all of thee what did i fear thy love shall hold me fast until the little minute's sleep is past and i wake saved and yet it will not be end of poem this recording is in the public domain at the word farewell by thomas hardy read for librivox.org by chris she looked like a bird from a cloud on the clammy lawn 
moving alone, bare-browed, in the dim of dawn. The candles alight in the room, for my parting meal, made all things without doors loom. Strange, ghostly, unreal, the hour itself was a ghost, and it seemed to me then, as of chances, the chance furthermost, I should see her again. I beheld not where all was so fleet, that a plan of the past, which had ruled us, from birth time to meet, was in working at last. No prelude did I there perceive to a drama at all, or foreshadow what fortune might weave from beginnings so small. But I rose as if quicked by a spur, I was bound to obey, and stepped through the casement to her, still alone in the gray. I am leaving you, farewell, I said, as I followed her on by an alley bare bows overspread. I soon must be gone. Even then the scale might have been turned against love by a feather, but crimson one cheek of hers burned when we came in together. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Autumn, a dirge, by Percy B. Shelley. Read for LibriVox.org by Sajad Rahmani. September 2012, Oslo, Norway, www.sajad.net. The warm sun is failing, the bleak wind is wailing, the bare boughs are sighing, the pale flowers are dying, and the year, on the earth her deathbed in a shroud of leaves dead, is lying. Come months, come away from November to May in your saddest array. Follow the bier of the dead cold year, and like dim shadows watch by her sepulchre. The chill rain is falling, the nipped worm is crawling, the rivers are swelling, the thunder is knelling for the year. The blithe swallows are flown, and the lizards each gone to his dwelling. Come months, come away, put on white, black, and gray, let your light sisters play, ye follow the bier of the dead cold year, and make her grave green with tear on tear. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Brother and Sister by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by Britannia Sister, sister, go to bed. Go and rest your weary head. That's the prudent brother said. Do you want a battered hide or scratches to your face applied? Thus his sister calm replied. Sister, do not raise my wrath. I'll make you into mutton broth as easily as I kill a mouth. The sister raised a beaming eye and looked on him indignantly and sternly and said, Only try. Off to the cook, he quickly ran. Dear cook, please lend a frying pan to me as quickly as you can. And wherefore should I lend it you? The reason, cook, is plain to you. I wish to make an Irish stew. What meat is in that stew to go? My sister will be the contents. Oh. You lend the pan to me, cook? No. Moral, never stew your sister. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Carpenter's Son by A. E. Houseman. Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Here the hangman stops his cart. Now the best of friends must part. Fare you well, for ill fare I. Live, lads, and I will die. 
oh at home had i but stayed prenticed to my father's trade had i stuck to plain and ads i had not been lost my lads then i might have built perhaps gallows trees for other chaps never dangled on my own had i left but ill alone now you see they hang me high and the people passing by stop to shake their fists and curse so tis come from ill to worse here hang i and right and left two poor fellows hang for theft all the same's the luck we prove though the midmost hangs for love comrades all that stand and gaze walk henceforth in other ways see my neck and save your own comrades all leave ill alone make some day a decent end shrewder fellows than your friend fare you well for ill fare i live lads and i will die end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Chances by Wilfred Owen Read by Tech Savvy I mind as o oh, the night afore that show us five got talking we was in the know Over the top to morrow boys we are for it first wave we are first ruddy wave that's tore it ah well says jimmy and e's seen some scraping there ain't more nor five things as can appen ye get knocked out else wounded bad or cushy scuppered or not except ye feeling mushy one of us got the knockout blown to chops the other was hurt like losing both his props and one to use the word of apocrites add the misfortune to be took by frets now me i wasn't scratched praise god almighty Though next time, please, I'll thank him for a blighty. But poor young Jim, he's living and he's not. He reckoned it five chances, and he's had. He's wounded, killed, and prisoner, all the lot. The ruddy lot all rolled in one. Jim's mad. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Diverting History of John Gilpin Showing How He Went Farther Than He Intended and Came Safe Home Again by William Cowper Read for LibriVox.org by Yule Niedermeyer John Gilpin was a citizen of credit and renown. A train band captain eke was he of famous London town. John Gilpin's bow said to her dear, though what it we have been these twice ten tedious years yet we no holiday have seen to-morrow is our wedding day and we will then repair unto the bell at edmonton all in a chaise and pair my sister and my sister's child myself and children three will fill the chaise so you must ride on horseback after we he soon replied i do admire of womankind but one and you are she my dearest dear therefore it shall be done i am a linen draper bold as all the world doth know, and my good friend, the calendar, will lend his horse to go. Quoth Mrs. Gilpin, that's well said, and for that wine is dear, we will be furnished with our own, which is both bright and clear. John Gilpin kissed his loving wife, where joy was he to find, that though on pleasure she was spent, she had a frugal mind. The morning came, the chaise was brought, but yet was not allowed to drive up to the door, lest all should say that she was proud. So three doors off, the chaise was stayed, 
for they did all get in six precious souls and all agog to dash through thick and thin smack went the whip round went the wheels were never fox so clad the stones to treadle underneath as if cheapside were mad john gilpin at his horse's side seized fast the flowing mane and up he got in haste to ride but soon came down again for saddle tree scarce reached had he his journey to begin when turning round his head he saw three customers come in so down he came for loss of time although it grieved him sore yet loss of pence full well he knew would trouble him much more twas long before the customers were suited to their mind when betty screaming came downstairs the wine is left behind good luck quoth he yet bring it me my leathern belt likewise in which i bear my trusty sword when i do exercise now mistress gilpin careful soul had two stone bottles found to hold the liquor that she loved and keep it safe and sound each bottle had a curling ear through which the belt he drew and hung a bottle on each side to make his balance true then over all that he might be equipped from top to toe his long red cloak well brushed and neat he manfully did throw now see him mounted once again upon his nimble steed full slowly pacing o'er the stones with caution and good heed but finding soon a smoother road beneath his well-shod feet the snorting beast began to trot which galled him in his seat so fair and softly john he cried but john he cried in vain the trot became a gallop soon in spite of curb and rein so stooping down as needs he must who cannot sit upright he grasped the mane with both his hands and eked with all his might his horse who never in that sort had handled been before what thing upon his back had got did wonder more and more away went gilpin neck or not away went head and wig he little dreamt when he set out of running such a rig the wind did blow the cloak did fly like streamer long and gay till loop and button failing both at last it flew away then might all people well discern the bottles he had slung a bottle swinging at each side as hath been said or sung the dogs did bark the children screamed up flew the windows all and every soul cried out well done as loud as he could brawl away went gilpin who but he his fame soon spread around he carries weight he rides a race tis five thousand pound and still as fast as he drew near twas wonderful to few how in a trice the turnpike man their gates wide open through and now as he went bowing down his reeking head full low the bottles twain behind his back were shattered at a blow down ran the wine into the road most piteous to be seen which made the horse's flanks to smoke as they had bastard been but still he seemed to carry weight with leathern girdle braced for all might see the bottle necks still dangling at his waist thus all through merry islington these gambles he did play until he came unto the wash of edmonton so gay and there he threw the wash about on both sides of the way just like unto a trundling mob or a wild goose at play at edmonton his loving wife from the balcony spied her tender husband wondering much to see how he did ride stop stop john gilpin here's the house they all at once did cry the dinner waits and we are tired said gilpin so am i but yet his horse was not a whit inclined to tarry there for why his owner had a house full ten miles off at where so like an arrow swift he flew should by an archer strong so did he fly which brings me to the middle of my song away went gilpin out of breath and sore against his will till at his friend the calendars his horse at last stood still the calendar amazed to see his neighbour in such trim laid down his pipe flew to the gate and thus accosted him what news what news your tidings tell tell me you must and shall say why by here that you are come or why you come at all now gilpin had a pleasant wit and laughed a timely joke and thus unto the calendar in merry guise he spoke i came because your horse would come and if i well forbode my hat and wig will soon be here they are upon the road the calendar right glad to find his friend in merry pin returned him not a single word but to the house went in whence straight he came with hat and wig a wig that flowed behind a hat not much the worse for wear each comely in its kind he held them up and in his turn thus showed his ready wit my head is twice as big as yours they therefore needs must fit but let me scrape the dirt away that hangs upon your face and stop and eat for well you may be in a hungry case said john it is my wedding day and all the world would stare if wife should dine at edmonton and i should dine at ware so turning to his horse he said i am in haste to dine Thus for your pleasure you came here you shall go back for mine ah luckless speech and bootless boast for which he paid full dear 
for while he spake a braying ass did sing most loud and clear whereat his horse did snort as he had heard a lion roar and galloped off with all his might as he had done before away went gilpin and away went gilpin's head and wig he lost them sooner than at first for why they were too big now mistress gilpin when she saw her husband posting down into the country far away she pulled out half a crown and thus unto the youths she said that drove them to the bell this shall be yours when you bring back my husband safe and well the youth did ride and soon did meet john coming back amain whom in a trice he tried to stop by catching at his rein but not performing what he meant and gladly would have done the frighted steed he frighted more and made him faster run away went gilpin and away went postboy at his heels the postboy's horse right glad to miss the lumbering of the wheels six gentlemen upon the road thus seeing gilpin fly with postboy scampering in the rear they raise the ewe and cry stop thief stop thief a highwayman not one of them was mute and all and each that passed that way did join in their pursuit and now the turnpike gates again flew open in short space the tall man thinking as before that gilpin rode a race and so he did and won it too for he got first to town nor stopped till where he had got up he did again get down now let us sing long live the king and gilpin long live he and when he next doth ride abroad may i be there to see end of poem this recording is in the public domain Domination of Black by Wallace Stevens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Domination of Black. At night, by the fire, the colors of the bushes and of the fallen leaves, repeating themselves, turned in the room, like the leaves themselves, turning in the wind. Yes, but the color of the heavy hemlocks came striding. And I remembered the cry of the peacocks. The colors of their tails were like the leaves themselves, turning in the wind. In the twilight wind, they swept over the room, just as they flew from the boughs of the hemlocks down to the ground. I heard them cry, the peacocks. Was it a cry against the twilight, or against the leaves themselves, turning in the wind, turning as the flames turned in the fire, turning as the tails of the peacocks turned in the loud fire loud as the hemlocks full of the cry of the peacocks or was it a cry against the hemlocks out of the window i saw how the plants gathered like the leaves themselves turning in the wind i saw how the night came came striding like the color of the heavy hemlocks i felt afraid and i remembered the cry of the peacocks. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Dream by John Donne. Read for LibriVox.org by Capricia Page. Dear love, for nothing less than thee would I have broke this happy dream. It was a theme for reason, much too strong for fantasy. Therefore thou wakest me wisely, yet my dream thou brokest not, but continuest it. Thou art so truth, that thoughts of thee suffice, to make dreams truths, and fables histories. Enter these arms, for since thou thought'st it best, not to dream all my dream let's act the rest as lightning or a taper's light thine eyes and not thy noise waked me yet i thought thee for thou lovest truth an angel at first sight but when i saw thou saw'st my heart and knew'st my thoughts beyond an angel's art when thou knew'st what i dreamt when thou knewst when excess of joy would wake me, And camest then, I must confess, I would not choose but be profane, To think thee anything but thee. Coming and staying showed thee thee, But rising makes me doubt That now thou art not thou. That love is weak, 
where fears as strong as he tis not all spirit pure and brave if mixture it of fear shame honour have perchance as torches which must ready be men light and put out so thou dealest with me thou camest to kindle goest to come then i will dream that hope again but else would die end of poem this recording is in the public domain friendship by friedrich schiller read for LibriVox.org by cynthia moyer friend the great ruler easily content needs not the laws it has laborious been the task of small professors to invent a single wheel impels the whole machine matter and spirit yea that simple law pervading nature which our newton saw this taught the spheres slaves to one golden reign their radiant labyrinths to weave around creation's mighty hearts this made the chain which into interwoven systems bound all spirits streaming to the spiritual sun as brooks that ever into ocean run did not the same strong mainspring urge and guide our hearts to meet in love's eternal bond linked to thine arm o raphael by thy side might i aspire to reach to souls beyond our earth and bid the bright ambition go to that perfection which the angels know happy o oh happy i have found thee i have out of millions found thee and embraced thou out of millions mine let earth and sky return to darkness and the antique waste to chaos shocked let warring atoms be still shall each heart unto the other flee do i not find within thy radiant eyes fairer reflections of all joys most fair in thee i marvel at myself the dyes of lovely earth seem lovelier painted there and in the bright looks of the friend is given a heavenlier mirror even of the heaven sadness casts off its load and gaily goes from the intolerant storm to rest awhile in love's true heart sure haven of repose does not pain's various transports learn to smile from that bright eloquence affection gave to friendly looks there finds not pain a grave in all creation did i stand alone still to the rocks my dreams a soul should find mine arms should wreathe themselves around the stone my griefs should feel a listener in the wind my joy its echo in the caves should be fool if ye will fool for sweet sympathy we are dead groups of matter when we hate but when we love we are as gods unto the gentle fetters yearning through each state and shade of being multiform and through all countless spirits save of all the sire moves breathes and blends the one divine desire lo arm in arm through every upward grade from the rude mongrel to the starry greek who the fine link between the mortal maid and heaven's last seraph everywhere we seek union and bond till in one sea sublime of love be merged all measure and all time friendless ruled god his solitary sky he felt the want 
and therefore souls were made the blessed mirrors of his bliss his eye no equal in his loftiest works surveyed and from the source whence souls are quickened he called his companion forth eternity end of poem this recording is in the public domain he remembers forgotten beauty by william butler yeats read for LibriVox.org by tulip parker flanagan when my arms wrap you round i press my heart upon the loveliness that has long faded from the world the jeweled crowns that kings have hurled in shadowy pools when armies fled the love tales wrought with silken thread by dreaming ladies upon cloth that has made fat the murderous moth the roses that of old time were woven by ladies in their hair the dew-cold lilies ladies bore through many a sacred corridor where such gray clouds of incense rose that only god's eyes did not close for that pale breast and lingering hand come from a more dream-heavy land a more dream-heavy hour than this and when you sigh from kiss to kiss i hear white beauty sighing too for hours when all must fade like dew but flame on flame and deep on deep throne over throne wherein half sleep their swords upon their iron knees brood her high lonely mysteries end of poem this recording is in the public domain How One Winter Came in the Lake Region by Wilfred Campbell Read by Tech Savvy For weeks and weeks the autumn world stood still, clothed in the shadow of a smoky haze. The fields were dead, the wind had lost its will, and all the lands were hushed by the wood and hill in those gray withered days behind a mist the blear sun rose and set at night the moon would nestle in a cloud the fisherman a ghost did cast his net the lake its shores forgot to chafe and fret and hushed its caverns loud far in the smoky woods the birds were mute save that from blackened tree a jay would scream or far in the swamps the lizard's lonesome lute would pipe in thirst or by some gnarled root the tree toad trilled his dream from day to day still hushed by season's mood the stream stayed in the runnels shrunk and dry suns rose august by wave and shore and wood and all the world with ominous silence stood in weird expectancy when one strange night the sun like blood went down flooding the heavens in a ruddy hue red grew the lake the sea fields parched and brown red grew the marshes where creeks stole down but never a wind breath blew that night i felt the winter in my veins a joyous tremor of the icy glow and woke to hear the north's wild vibrant strains while far and wide by withered woods and plains fast 
fell the driving snow. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In a Museum by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Chris Here's the mold of a musical bird long past from light, which over the earth, before man came, was winging. There's a contralto voice I heard last night that lodges in me still with its sweet singing. Such a dream in time that the coo of this ancient bird has perished not, but is blent, or will be blending. Mud visionless, wilds of space, with a voice that I heard, in the full fuge song of the universe unending. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lady of Shalott by Alfred Lord Tennyson Read for LibriVox.org by Astaria On either side the river lie Long fields of barley and of rye That clothe the world and meet the sky And through the field the road runs by To many towered Camelot And up and down the people go Gazing where the lilies blow Round an island there below the island of Shalott. Willows whiten, aspens quiver, Little breezes dusk and shiver Through the wave that runs forever By the island in the river Flowing down to Camelot. Four grey walls and four grey towers Overlook a space of flowers, And the silent isle embowers The Lady of Shalott. By the margin, willow veiled, slide the heavy barges trailed, by slow horses and unhailed. The shallop flitteth, silken sailed, skimming down to Camelot. But who hath seen her wave her hand, or at the seasement seen her stand, or is she known in all the land, the Lady of Shalott? Only reapers reaping early. In among the bearded barley, hear a song that echoes cheerly from the river winding clearly down to towered Camelot. And by the moon, the reaper weary, piling sheaves in uplands airy, listening, whispers, tis the fairy lady of Shalott. There she weaves by night and day a magic web with colours gay. She has heard a whisper say, a curse is on her if she stay to look down to Camelot. She knows not what the curse may be, and so she weaveth steadily, and little other care hath she, the Lady of Shalott. And moving through a mirror clear, that hangs before her all the year, shadows of the world appear, there she sees the highway near, winding down to Camelot. There the river eddy whirls, and there the surely village churls, and the red cloaks of market girls pass onward from Shalott. Sometimes a troop of damsels glad, an abbot on an ambling pad, sometimes a curly shepherd lad, or long-haired page in crimson clad, goes by to towered Camelot, and sometimes through the mirror blue, the knights come riding two and two, she hath no loyal knight and true, the Lady of Shalott, but in her web she still delights to weave the mirror's magic sights, for often through the silent nights a funeral with plumes and lights and music went to Camelot, or when the moon was overheard came two young lovers lately wed i am half sick of shadows said the lady of shalott a bow shot from her bower eaves he rode between the barley sheaves the sun came dazzling through the leaves and flamed upon the brazen greaves of bold sir lancelot 
a red cross knight forever kneeled to a lady in his shield that sparkled on the yellow field beside remote shalott all in the blue unclouded weather thick jewelled shone the saddle leather the helmet and the helmet feather burned like one burning flame together as he rode down to camelot as oft through the purple night below the starry clusters bright some bearded meteor trailing light moves over still shalott his broad clear brow in sunlight glowed on burnished hooves his war-horse trode from underneath his helmet flowed his coal-black curls as on he rode as he rode down to camelot from the bank and from the river he flashed into the crystal mirror tira lira by the river sang sir lancelot she left the web she left the loom she made three paces through the room she saw the water lily bloom she saw the helmet and the plume she looked down to camelot out flew the web and floated wide the mirror cracked from side to side the curse has come upon me cried the lady of shalott in the stormy east wind straining the pale yellow woods were waning the broad stream in his banks complaining heavily the low sky raining over towered camelot down she came and found a boat beneath a willow left afloat and round about the prow she wrote the lady of shalott and down the river's dim expanse like some bold seer in a trance seeing all his own mischance with a glassy countenance did she look to camelot and at the closing of the day she loosed the chain and down she lay the broad stream bore her far away the lady of shalott lying robbed in snowy white that loosely flew to left and right the leaves upon her falling light through the noises of the night she floated down to camelot and as the boat head wound along the willowy hills and fields among they heard her singing her last song the lady of shalott heard a carol mournful holy chanted loudly chanted lowly till her blood was frozen slowly and her eyes were darkened wholly turned to towered camelot for ere she reached upon the tide the first house by the water side singing in her song she died the lady of shalott under tower and balcony by garden wall and gallery a gleaming shape she floated by dead pale between the houses high silent into camelot out upon their walks they came knight and burgher lord and dame and around the prow they read her name the lady of shalott who is this and what is here and in the lighted palace near died the sound of royal cheer and they crossed themselves for fear all the knights at camelot but lancelot mused a little space he said she has a lovely face god in his mercy lend her grace the lady of shalott end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Lover of Jalaluddin by James Elroy Flecker Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Geeson In Hazelmere, Surrey My darling wandered through the house, His bow upon the rebeck, light as flame. Soft melodies he played, astray with sweet carouse mad songs without a name then changing to a solemn mode and measure cup-bearer wine he cried wine for the sons of pleasure the children of desire forth from his corner came the moon-bright boy and set the brimming bowl before us with sweet reverence and grace my darling took the cup 
over his face flowed truant flames ye evil ghosts he cried i know my beauty who is like to me the sun of all the world the lover's pride i am i was shall be with soul and spirit moving at my side end of poem this recording is in the public domain Merry Autumn by Paul Lawrence Dunbar Read for LibriVox.org by Sajad Rahmani September 2012, Oslo, Norway www.sajad.net It's all a farce, these tales they tell About the breezes sighing and moans astare Over field and dell because the year is dying such principles are most absurd i care not who first taught em there's nothing known to beast or bird to make a solemn autumn in solemn times when grief holds sway with countenance distressing you'll note the more of black and gray will then be used in dressing now purple tints are all around the sky is blue and mellow and even the grass has turned the ground from modest green to yellow the seed burrs all with laughter crack on featherweed and jimson and leaves that should be dressed in black are all decked out in crimson a butterfly goes winging by a singing bird comes after and nature all from earth to sky is bubbling over with laughter the ripples wimple on the rills like sparkling little lasses the sunlight runs along the hills and laughs among the grasses the earth is just so full of fun it really can't contain it and streams of mirth so freely run the heavens seem to rain it don't talk to me of solemn days in autumn's time of splendor because the sun shows fewer rays and these grow slant and slander why it's the climax of the year the highest time of living till naturally its bursting cheer just melts into thanksgiving End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode on the Popular Superstitions of the Highlands of Scotland by William Collins Read for LibriVox.org by Cynthia Moyer 1. Home, thou returnst from Thames, whose naiads long have seen thee lingering with a fond delay mid those soft friends whose hearts some future day shall melt perhaps to hear thy tragic song go not unmindful of that cordial youth whom long endeared thou leav'st by levant's side together let us wish him lasting truth and joy untainted with his destined bride go nor regardless while these numbers boast my short-lived bliss forget my social name but think far off how on the southern coast i met thy friendship with an equal flame fresh to that soil thou turnst where every vale shall prompt the poet and his song demand to thee thy copious subjects ne'er shall fail thou need'st but take thy pencil to thy hand and paint what all believe who own thy genial land two there must thou wake perforce thy doric quill tis fancy's land to which thou set'st thy feet where still tis said the fairy people meet beneath each birken shade on mead or hill there each trim lass that skims the milky store to the swart tribes their creamy bowls allots by night they sip it round the cottage door while airy minstrels warble jocund notes there every herd 
by sad experience knows how winged with fate their elf-shot arrows fly when the sick ewe her summer food foregoes or stretched on earth the heart-smit heifers lie such airy beings awe the untutored swain nor thou though learned his homelier thoughts neglect let thy sweet muse the rural faith sustain these are the themes of simple sure effect that add new conquests to her boundless reign and fill with double force her heart commanding strain three even yet preserved how often mayst thou hear where to the pole the boreal mountains run taught by the father to his listening son strange lays whose power had charmed a spencer's ear at every pause before thy mind possessed old runic bards shall seem to rise around with uncouth lyres in many-coloured vest their matted hair with boughs fantastic crowned whether thou bidst the well-taught hind repeat the choral dirge that mourns some chieftain brave when every shrieking maid her bosom beat and strewed with choicest herbs his scented grave or whether sitting in the shepherd's shiel thou hearst some sounding tale of war's alarms when at the bugle's call with fire and steel the sturdy clans poured forth their brawny swarms and hostile brothers met to prove each other's arms four tis thine to sing how framing hideous spells in sky's lone isle the gifted wizard seer lodged in the wintry cave with fate's fell spear or in the depth of wist's dark forest dwells how they whose sight such dreary dreams engross with their own visions oft astonished droop when o'er the watery strath or quaggy moss they see the gliding ghost's unbodied troop or if in sports or on the festive green their destined glance some fated youth descry who now perhaps in lusty vigour seen and rosy health shall soon lamented die for them the viewless forms of air obey their bidding heed and at their beck repair they know what spirit brews the stormful day and heartless oft like moody madness stare to see the phantom train their secret work prepare five to monarchs dear some hundred miles astray oft have they seen fate give the fatal blow the seer in sky shrieked as the blood did flow when headless charles warm on the scaffold lay as boreas threw his young aurora forth in the first year of the first george's reign and battles raged in welkin of the north they mourned in air fell fell rebellion slain and as of late they joyed in preston's fight saw at sad falkirk all their hopes near crowned they raved divining through their second sight pale red culloden where these hopes were drowned illustrious william britain's guardian name one william saved us from a tyrant's stroke he for a sceptre gained heroic fame but thou more glorious slavery's chain hast broke to reign a private man and bow 
to freedom's yoke. 6. These too thou'lt sing, for well thy magic muse can to the topmost heaven of grandeur soar, or stoop to wail the swain that is no more. Ah, homely swains, your homeward steps ne'er lose. Let not dank will mislead you to the heath. Dancing in murky night or fen and lake, he glows to draw you downward to your death in his bewitched low marshy willow brake. What though far off from some dark dell espied, his glimmering mazes cheer the excursive sight, yet turn ye wanderers, turn your steps aside, nor trust the guidance of that faithless light. For watchful, lurking, mid the unrustling reed, at those murk hours the wily monster lies, and listens oft to hear the passing steed, and frequent round him rolls his sullen eyes, if chance his savage wrath may some weak wretch surprise. 7. Ah, luckless swain, o'er all unblessed indeed, whom late bewildered in the dank dark fen, far from his flocks and smoking hamlet then, to that sad spot where hums the sedgy weed, on him enraged the fiend in angry mood shall never look with pity's kind concern but instant furious raise the whelming flood o'er its drowned banks forbidding all return or if he meditate his wished escape to some dim hill that seems uprising near to his faint eye the grim and grisly shape in all its terrors clad shall wild appear meantime the watery surge shall round him rise poured sudden forth from every swelling source what now remains but tears and hopeless sighs his fear-shook limbs have lost their youthly force and down the waves he floats a pale and breathless course eight for him in vain his anxious wife shall wait or wander forth to meet him on his way for him in vain at two fall of the day his babes shall linger at the unclosing gate ah ne'er shall he return alone if night her travelled limbs in broken slumbers steep with drooping willows dressed his mournful sprite shall visit sad perchance her silent sleep then he perhaps with moist and watery hand shall fondly seem to press her shuddering cheek and with his blue swoln face before her stand and shivering cold these piteous accents speak pursue dear wife thy daily toils pursue at dawn or dusk industrious as before nor e'er of me one helpless thought renew while i lie weltering on the osiered shore drowned by the kelpie's wrath nor e'er shall aid thee more nine unbounded is thy range with varied skill thy muse may like those feathery tribes which spring from their rude rocks extend her skirting wing round the moist marge of each cold hebrid isle to that hoar pile which still its ruins shows in whose small vaults a pygmy folk is found whose bones the delver with his spade upthrows and culls them wandering from the hallowed ground or thither where beneath the showery west 
the mighty kings of three fair realms are laid once foes perhaps together now they rest no slaves revere them and no wars invade yet frequent now at midnight's solemn hour the rifted mounds their yawning cells unfold and forth the monarchs stalk with sovereign power in pageant robes and wreathed with sheeny gold and on their twilight tombs aerial council hold ten but o oh, o'er all forget not kilda's race on whose bleak rocks which brave the wasting tides fair nature's daughter virtue yet abides go just as they their blameless manners trace then to my ear transmit some gentle song of those whose lives are yet sincere and plain their bounded walks the rugged cliffs along and all their prospect but the wintry main with sparing temperance at the needful time they drain the scented spring or hunger pressed along the atlantic rock undreading climb and of its eggs despoil the solon's nest thus blest in primal innocence they live sufficed and happy with that frugal fare which tasteful toil and hourly danger give hard is their shallow soil and bleak and bare nor ever vernal bee was heard to murmur there eleven nor needst thou blush that such false themes engage thy gentle mind of fairer stores possessed for not alone they touch the village breast but filled in elder time the historic page there shakespeare's self with every garland crowned flew to those fairy climes his fancy sheen in musing hour his wayward sisters found and with their terrors dressed the magic scene from them he sung when mid his bold design before the scot afflicted and aghast the shadowy kings of banquo's fated line through the dark cave in gleamy pageant passed proceed nor quit the tales which simply told could once so well my answering bosom pierce proceed in forceful sounds and colours bold the native legends of thy land rehearse to such adapt thy lyre and suit thy powerful verse twelve in scenes like these which daring to depart from sober truth are still to nature true and call forth fresh delight to fancy's view the heroic muse employed her tasso's art how have i trembled when at tancred's stroke its gushing blood the gaping cypress poured when each live plant with mortal accents spoke and the wild blast upheaved the vanished sword how have i sat when piped the pensive wind to hear his harp by british fairfax strung prevailing poet whose undoubting mind believed the magic wonders which he sung hence at each sound imagination glows hence at each picture vivid life starts here hence his warm lay with softest sweetness flows melting it flows pure murmuring strong and clear and fills the impassioned heart and wins the harmonious ear thirteen all hail ye scenes that o'er my soul prevail ye splendid friths and lakes which far away 
are by smooth annan filled or pastoral tay or don's romantic springs at distance hail the time shall come when i perhaps may tread your lowly glens or hung with spreading broom or o'er your stretching heaths by fancy led or o'er your mountains creep in awful gloom then will i dress once more the faded bower where johnson sat in drummond's classic shade or crop from Tiviotdale each lyric flower and mourn on yarrow's banks where willie's laid meantime ye powers that on the plains which bore the cordial youth on lothian's plains attend where'er home dwells on hill or lowly moor to him i lose your kind protection lend and touched with love like mine preserve my absent friend end of poem this recording is in the public domain on the friendship betwixt two ladies by edmund waller read for LibriVox.org by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey tell me lovely loving pair why so kind and so severe why so careless of our care only to yourselves so dear by this cunning change of hearts you the power of love control while the boy's eluded darts can arrive at neither soul for in vain to either breast still beguiled love does come where he finds a foreign guest neither of your hearts at home debtors thus with like design when they never mean to pay that they may the law decline to some friend make all away oh, not the silver doves that fly yoked in cytherea's car not the wings that lift so high and convey her son so far are so lovely sweet and fair or do more ennoble love are so choicely matched a pair or with more consent do move end of poem this recording is in the public domain prometheus by george gordon lord byron read for LibriVox.org by sean maddy titan to whose immortal eyes the sufferings of mortality seen in their sad reality were not as things that gods despise what was thy pity's recompense a silent suffering and intense the rock the vulture and the chain all that the proud can feel of pain the agony they do not show the suffocating sense of woe which speaks but in its loneliness and then is jealous lest the sky should have a listener nor will sigh until its voice is echoless titan to thee the strife was given between the suffering and the will which torture where they cannot kill and the inexorable heaven and the deaf tyranny of fate the ruling principle of hate which for its pleasure doth create the things it may annihilate refused thee even the boon to die the wretched gift eternity was thine and thou hast borne it well all that the thunderer wrung from thee was but the menace which flung back on him the torments of thy rack the fate thou didst so well foresee but would not to appease him tell and in thy silence was his sentence and in his soul a vain repentance and evil dread so ill dissembled that in his hand the lightnings trembled thy godlike crime was to be kind 
to render with thy precepts less the sum of human wretchedness, and strengthen man with his own mind. But baffled as thou wert from high, still in thy patient energy, in the endurance and repulse of thine impenetrable spirit, which earth and heaven could not convulse, a mighty lesson we inherit. Thou art a symbol and a sign to mortals of their fate and force. Like thee, man is in part divine, a troubled stream from a pure source. And man in portions can foresee his own funereal destiny, his wretchedness and his resistance and his sad unallied existence, to which his spirit may oppose itself and equal to all woes, and a firm will and a deep sense which even in torture can descry its own concentred recompense, triumphant where it dares defy, and making death a victory. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Queen of Hearts by Christina Georgina Rossetti Read for LibriVox.org by Verity Kendall how comes it, Flora, that whenever we play cards together, you invariably, however the pack parts, still hold the Queen of Hearts? I've scanned you with a scrutinizing gaze, resolved to fathom these your secret ways, but sift them as I will, your ways are secret still. I cut and shuffle, shuffle, cut, again, but all my cutting, shuffling, proves in vain, vain hope, vain forethought, too. The queen still falls to you. I dropped her once, prepense, but ere the deal was dealt, your instinct seemed her lost feel. There should be one card more, you said, and searched the floor. I cheated once. I made a private notch in the heart queen's back and kept a lynx-eyed watch. Yet such another back deceived me in the pack. The queen of clubs assumed by arts unknown, an imitative dint that seemed my own. This notch, not of my doing, misled me to my ruin. It baffles me to puzzle out the clue, which must be skill or craft or luck in you, unless indeed it be natural affinity. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by George Snow, www.george-snow.com The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor, I murmured, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. Ah, distinctly, I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books, so cease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, nameless here for evermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating. "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, "'some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. "'This it is, and nothing more. "'Presently my soul grew stronger, "'hesitating then no longer. "'Sir,' said I, "'or oh, madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, "'but the fact is I was napping, "'and so gently you came rapping, "'and so Thickly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. Deep, 
Into that darkness, peering long, I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the darkness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeyance made he, not a minute stopped nor stayed he, but with mien of lord and lady perched above my chamber door. Perched upon the bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then. This ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly, grim, and ancient raven, wandering from the knightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Never. Much I marvelled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast above the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as Nevermore. But the raven sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further then he uttered, not a feather then he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply, so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore, of never, never more. But the raven, still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining, with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press. Ah, never more. Then methought the air grew denser, perfumed by an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch! I cried, thy God hath lent thee. By these angels he hath sent thee. Respite, respite, and nepanth from my memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff, this kind nepanth, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore. Desolate, yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by the heaven that bends above us, and by the God we both adore, Tell the soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels named Lenore. 
clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of the lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart. Take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. End of the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe This recording is in the public domain. The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost Read for LibriVox.org by Ratan Deep Satwant Singh the road not taken two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry i could not travel both and be one traveller long i stood and looked down one as far as i could to where it bent in the undergrowth then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted weir, though as far that the passing there had worn them really about the same, and both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less travelled by, and that has made all the difference. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Silence by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp There is a silence where hath been no sound. There is a silence where no sound may be, In the cold grave, under the deep, deep sea, Or in wide desert where no life is found, Which hath been mute and still must sleep profound. No voice is hushed, no life treads silently, but clouds and cloudy shadows wander free that never spoke over the idle ground. But in green ruins, in the desolate walls of antique palaces where man hath been, though the dun fox or wild hyena calls, and owls that flit continually between shriek to the echo, and the low winds moan, there the true silence is, self-conscious and alone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Time to Talk by Robert Frost Read for LibriVox.org by Ratandeep Satwant Singh Jamshedpur, India A Time to Talk When a friend calls to me from the road and slows his horse to a meaning walk. I don't stand still and look around on all the hills I haven't hoed, and shout from where I am. What is it? No, not as there is a time to talk. I thrust my hoe in the mellow ground, blade end up and five feet tall, and plod. 
I go up to the stone wall for a friendly visit. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Turn Ye to Me by John Wilson Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp The stars are shining cheerily, cheerily. Horo maridu, turn ye to me. The sea mew is moaning drearily, drearily. Horo maridu, turn ye to me. Cold is the storm wind that ruffles his breast, but warm are the downy plumes lining his nest. Cold blows the storm there, soft falls the snow there. Ho, ro, maridu, turn ye to me. The waves are dancing merrily, merrily. Ho, ro, maridu, turn ye to me. The seabirds are wailing wearily, wearily. Ho, ro, maridu, turn ye to me. Hushed be thy moaning, lone bird of the sea. Thy home on the rocks is a shelter to thee. Thy home is the angry wave. Mine but the lonely grave. Ho, ro, maridu, turn ye to me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. When We Two Parted by Lord Byron Read for LibriVox.org by Cusper Nyssen. When we two parted in silence and tears, Half broken-hearted to sever for years, Pale grew thy cheek and cold, cold that I kiss, Truly that hour foretold sorrow to this. The dew of the morning sunk chill on my brow, It felt like the warning of what I feel now. Thy vows are all broken, and light is thy fame. I hear thy name spoken, and share in its shame. They name thee before me, a knell to mine ear. A shudder comes o'er me, why wert thou so dear? They know not I knew thee, who knew thee too well. Long, long shall I rue thee, too deeply to tell. In secret we met, in silence I grieve, that thy heart could forget, thy spirit deceive. If I should meet thee after long years, how should I greet thee with silence and tears? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.